Well, I want to welcome to the program, Dr. Ralph Martin. Hey, thanks, Ralph, for taking time to be with me today. I'm thrilled that I get a chance to to connect with you, and I have a reason. I have a nice excuse to be able to get you on and and to have a chance to interview you. Yeah, well, it's great to reconnect with you, Tom, because I remember the many years when you were a sidekick, a disciple, a friend, a brother to uh, Father Tom Forrest, who's one of the great figures of evangelization in the church in recent years. And uh, we miss him not being with us, but we're glad you still are. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I appreciate that. Uh, boy, that, that, that is, that's a very meaningful thing. Uh, uh, Father Tom, it's, it's so funny. Talk about a funny story. I had people coming to our wedding, my wife, Carrie and I, when we got married, because he was preaching at our wedding. So we had a full church and I hate to say they weren't all there to celebrate Kerry and my nuptial mass, but to hear him, hear him preach. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he couldn't preach anything except fire. It was always fiery. Yeah. I would, I would consider him the greatest pure preacher that I ever had the gift of hearing. Uh, mm. And by that, I mean, like when I would give talks, I would weave in stories and humor and I have to jazz it up. Mm -hmm. Father Tom, he had the ability when he spoke scripture and when mm -hmm. he talked, it was so in him. It was still personal. It was like he could he could be personal without having to tell a personal story. That I guess that's my way of saying a pure yes. preacher. He was the word that he was preaching and teaching. Well, that's a really great way of describing it. I, I, I agree with that diagnosis, really. Uh, he uh, he believed the word he was speaking. And he spoke it with such fervor and faith that it, it came across as very powerful, very authoritative. Like, it made me think of what people said about Jesus. This man speaking with authority, unlike the scribes and Pharisees, he spoke with the authority of Christ himself who was living in him, but also because Father Tom believed the revealed word of God. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, you talk about first meetings. That wasn't our first meeting. Uh, you you probably don't remember our first meeting. It was at St. Marie's Catholic Church no, in Manchester, New Hampshire. Now, now you reminded me, I remember. You were there yeah. with Father Mark Montmany. Father Mark Montmany. Talk about another, like just an amazing holy priest of God who mm -hmm. God used and still is using in, in incredible ways to... Mm -hmm bring about renewal in the church. Yeah. No, uh, Father Mark was ahead of his time. He probably still is. Uh, they're really working for real renewal and evangelization and holiness, a renewed parish, lay empowerment. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's one of the heroes of our time too. And he's still alive, still doing. Yeah. It's, isn't that funny? So I met you at, it was, uh, it was the, um, it was a contemplative retreat house and you were staying there and I came over to get you because you were speaking on Saturday night or you had just arrived and then you were sp speaking at that event and I brought you into the church and um, I don't know, it, I think it was uh, a woman named Betty Brennan um, mm. had given a talk on healing and you had yep. walked in and we had all of these people praying for healing and you had to step over all of these people <laughs> in the church yeah. to, uh, to be able to, to get there. And it was just like a sign of God just falling on his people with his uh, intent to display his kingdom and mm -hmm. to show signs and wonders and deeds of power and, it was, you know, I don't want to say it was sort of the glory days, but it was a manifestation of God's yeah. glory in those days. Yeah, well, there's times of revival and times of plugging away and, you know, and, you know, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, we're supposed to preach the gospel. Well, OK, so, Ralph, here we are. It's 33 years later. I've now been married almost 29 years. OK. Blessed with nine ki nine kiddos. Wonderful. Uh, since then, we've both completed our, our doctorates in theology. Oh. And uh, so I, I want to say... Um, Holy wife, Dr. Carey. <laughs> yeah. So my wife is not a doctor. She does have a master's degree. And oh, uh, she's a, if she's a, an expert in anything, it's a, being a, a mom. So yeah. Uh, yeah, blessed with that, with the nine kiddos. Um, but I, I here's my kind of opening question for you, uh, Ralph. Like, what was that all about, right? So let's let's take a look at the past thirty three years and and let's see, 
like sort of this arc of what's happened in the church. Yeah. And here's how I want to describe it. And you let me know if it's overstated. Back then, I was a director of evangelization doing all this evangelistic work. And the principal objection I would receive when I would travel around the country and speak at these events saying, let's stir up efforts of evangelization. The number one objection was, I'm overwhelmed by the number of people I'm serving. Why do I want to evangelize at all? It was a resistance yeah. based on the churches were already full and there was so much going on. Why do we need to evangelize? That's only going to mean more work. I don't know if you remember that moment, but no, it was- that, a that was a concern of priests that this focus on new evangelization was going to just load on top of what they're already doing and you know, being too much. You know. Yeah. And, and there was a, it was easy to be, let me call it relentlessly positive, right? Mm -hmm. That the church still had a seat at the table, was still influential in our wider society, was still impacting culture. Here we are 33 years later, and I feel like there's been a shift from being relentlessly positive to being reverently prophetic, that there's a need, a, 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 a deep need to be willing to stand up, speak out, and push back against the culture and the society that the church finds herself in. Yeah. I, I When I think about these 33 years, that's almost one of the biggest shifts, I would say, yeah. is this fundamental call to be different in how I live my mission. Does that strike you at all? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it really makes me think, as I have oftentimes recently, about what Father Ratzinger said many years ago, way, way back at the end of the 60s and 70s. He said, most people don't realize it yet, but the church is going to go through a painful process of purification. We're going to lose a lot of our influence, our prestige in society. We're going to lose our buildings and our money and a lot of our people. It's going to be very painful. And out of that, though, is going to come a purified church that is able to be a witness to Jesus more authentically than we have been in certain ways over the years. So yeah, it's painful. And in many places in, in our country right now, the pain is closing parishes and closing schools and other parts of the country. It's like this incredible out in the open now hostility to Christ in the church, you know, like, uh, are you still living in the Northwest and, uh, Seattle or yeah. Yeah. I moved four years ago. We'll get into that story yeah, of um, sort yeah, of a yeah. Benedict option. We're now in Spokane, Coeur d'Alene in that area where okay. there's tremendous renewal and revival happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're living in the Northwest where, I mean, the rejection of Christ in the church, the rejection of the 10 commandments, mm -hmm. the rejection of the natural law, uh, the rejection of reality, <laughs> you know, it's just really proceeding at pace. So, I think the only way that Catholics can survive in the coming days is to get really clear, you know, and answer the question, who do you say he is? You know, who, who is Jesus? If Jesus is the really the Lord, the only sensible response to make to him is complete surrender, doing what he asks us to do and being formed by the word of God. And I think, you know, Catholics, they just need to recover their confidence and in the inspiration and inerrancy of sacred scripture uh, the need to find brothers and sisters in Christ, which it sounds like what you've done by moving to Spokane and Coeur Lane. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, we're we're in serious, differently time, different times. You know, we're, we're living not only in a post-Christian culture, but in a positively anti-Christian culture. Yeah. So, Ralph, I'm going to uh, I'm going to throw a sentence out to you that I've started to use. And um, tell me what you think about it. it and it's this. It takes a heroic effort to raise an ordinary Catholic. It takes a heroic effort to raise a practicing Catholic today. You're talking about family life? Family life. Yeah, children. absolutely. Yeah, no, no. There's a war going on for our children, honestly. And if we don't know we're in a war, and if we don't start really to use the spiritual weapons that the Lord gives us and the wisdom that God gives us, uh, our children are going to be swept away, even with our best efforts. We can't guarantee a good outcome for all of our kids, but we sure as heck, we got to work as hard as we can to uh, teach the faith to our children, to model the, the faith to our children, and to make wise choices about schools and formation and education and friendships and things like that. And I think, unfortunately, it's gotten to the place in most places in our country where 
it's very, very hard to send our children to public schools anymore. They're, they're really brainwashing institutions for this woke culture. The teachers unions, for the most part, are under the control of people who are repudiating Christ and the church, repudiating the very basics of reality. You know, God created us male and female for the purpose of coming together in holy marriage, open to life. It's not rocket science. It's clear. It's real. But people are totally rejecting that, drifting off into crazy unreality. So, yeah. Parents have really got to fight in a way that they didn't have to fight before. The faith is not being automatically transmitted by osmosis from generation to generation. Those intact communities of faith aren't there anymore for the most part. The ethnic communities aren't as strong in the faith as they used to be. And so we've got to start looking for conscious, explicit community. And we've got to be really intentional about what we need to do to raise our children and do our best effort to raise them. Although we can't guarantee the No, answer. Ralph, you had the 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 privilege, the grace, the insight to make that decision for your family, what, 40 years ago? How many yeah, years whatever, ago? Yeah, yeah. Well, what a gift, right? And I, I'm not sure a lot of folks realize that about your life, um, that it was impacted by Covenant Community. And yeah. help folks understand the difference and the power it makes, because um, what you said is more profound than I think most people realize when you say, unless you are grouping together with deep fellowship in intentional relationships with like-minded Catholic brothers and sisters, you will in fact have a high likelihood that your kids won't be practicing Catholics when they get older. I just restated what you said, but yeah. um, as, as yeah. a, just a kind of a tee up for you made a decision and yeah. Yeah. Well, the most important decision I've made was I was drifting away from the church. I was caught up in the confusion of the 60s. And, you know, who knows where I would have ended up. It wouldn't have been good. And then a friend invited me to make a cursio, which is an instrument of renewal in the Catholic Church. And to make a long story short, this Jesus that they were talking about at a certain point during the weekend, I felt like, I think he's here. I think he's real. I think he's in the room and I didn't see any voices. I didn't hear any voices or see any visions, but I just knew that he was present. And I also knew that he knew that I had noticed him. <laughs> yeah. And I, he, I knew that he was waiting for a response. He wasn't pressing. He wasn't forcing. He wasn't really very direct at all, but I knew that I needed to respond to him. He had let myself, he had let me, be aware of his presence. And then I really thought that if Jesus really is here, he's really the Lord, he's really raised from the dead. And I tried to bargain with him for a while. Like, oh Lord, you know, I'll come back to church if you let me do this, that, and the other thing. But I knew he wasn't primarily interested in me coming back to church, although that's part of it. What he really wanted was uh, unconditional surrender. You know, what he, what he really wanted was, here I am, Lord, your servant, waits your servant listens and, and by the grace of god i was able to humble myself on the last morning of the curcio and go to confession and be reconciled with the lord and the church and but then then some other things needed to happen you know i i think the next most important decision was knowing you need to take some time for personal prayer i you know that the, the feeling of his presence the feeling of his love was going to fluctuate but i knew that he was the most real person in my life i need to pay attention to him and build it into my life and then the next most important decision is that who else knows the Lord? You know, who else knows that we need to surrender our lives to him? You know, who else can I share this journey with, you know, and be supported by and support them? And so, you know, one of the things that the Curcio encourages people to do is to get into small groups. And so I got into a small men's group and we, uh, we met together regularly and we reviewed how we're doing and following the Lord. We reviewed our discipleship, our prayer, our study, our action, how we're doing in our families. I wasn't married at the time. Uh, and, and I've been in some kinds of men's groups for, you know, 50 years, not the same group. And I've been part of a wider network of Christian friendship for a while. It was covenant community, but you don't need to be part of a covenant community, but you do need spiritual friendship. You do need to be connected to other people who know who the Lord is and want to follow him and are willing to uh, orient their life around him and help you to do the same thing. So uh, here in Southeast Michigan, we're really blessed. We have 
a whole network of uh, Catholic support groups. We have the Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. We have Ave Maria Radio. We have La Goddess. We have Renewal Ministries that I'm associated with. We we just have a, a good parishes and good priests. And, uh, you know, we have Encounter Ministries up the road in Brighton. So it's just a whole network of uh, Catholic life here in Southeast Michigan. And so I imagine that's one of the reasons why you moved to where you were, that you could be part of a network like that that could support you and your family. So, yeah, we just need to to do that or it's going to be easy to get discouraged. It's going to be easy to get confused, like maybe I'm the crazy one. You know, maybe what they're saying to me, you know, is what I ought to go along with, you know, the type of thing. Or maybe the, the path of least resistance is to just trust that things are going to work out for my kids and let them go to public school and not go through the effort of, sacrificing to send them to a good Catholic school or homeschooling network or whatever. So it's going to be so easy to uh, drift along with the culture. And Jesus says, run and wide is a way that's leading to destruction. Many are traveling that way. Narrow is the path, difficult the road that leads to life. A few are who are finding it. And this isn't how Jesus wants it to be. He doesn't want us to be on the Broadway heading to destruction, but you don't drift into the kingdom of God by going along with the culture. You got to break with it. You know, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent bear away, the violence of conversion and repentance and taking up our cross every day and following Jesus. So I guess this is a long way of saying amen, Tom. <laughs> uh, well, that was the best lead up to amen that I've heard. It's uh, mm. it's beautiful and it's powerful. I'm talking with Ralph Martin today, Dr. Ralph Martin. He's the author of Fulfillment of All Desire. You can find out more about uh, Ralph and his ministry at renewalministries.net. I'll be showing you that website in the course of the interview. Um, Ralph, I've got so much more I want to share, uh, ask you about this. So you you talked about this reality of surrendering all to the Lord. You talked about this reality of, of getting daily prayer. You talked about the importance of fellowship. And it to me, those are things that require that sense of I'm determined to do this. But so often those desires get crowded out by mm -hmm. busyness, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and, and I I used to say when people say, oh, how are you doing? I say, I'm busy. And now I don't say that anymore. And I, I'll say this, I'll say, well, I'm busy, but that's just an excuse for saying I'm not living intentionally. And, mm. and, and it's true, right? If I was living intentionally, I wouldn't be busy. I would be focused. I would be mm. doing what the Lord has for me to do. And I wouldn't allow a life to get so dispersed that I didn't have the energy to be concentrated on mm -hmm. what the Lord had for me to do, which is yeah. to become a saint and to fulfill the God-given mission that he has for me. Yeah. And it, and it feels like today uh, that uh, one of the ways that many Catholics are being robbed of going deeper or living intentionally is just by living dispersed and distracted lives, yeah. dispersed into many things and distracted by what I've heard some people call the portal to hell, which is your smartphone. Mm -hmm. So dispersion and distraction as great enemies of the spiritual life, would you concur? Yes. Uh, I would want to say, though, that the Lord could have you doing a lot of things that are the right things that you're doing. And uh, to somebody outside, you might look like you're busy and you might even say you're busy, but you can be busy in the Lord with the Lord's things in the right proportion, the right balance. And that is really, really important. Uh, and, you know, all the things say you need a certain kind of interior solitude in order to properly ground your life and to hear the Lord. And uh, Bernard of Clairvaux says, you don't need to go away, live as a hermit. But you really need to limit your contact with the fascinations of the world, you know, and not be upset about what the world's upset, not be excited about what the world's excited, but really be rooted and grounded in the Lord. You know, like Jesus said, you know, hey, don't rejoice that you're casting out demons, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Or Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but be afraid of those who can kill the body and soul in hell. So getting our loves in order, getting our joys in order, getting our fears in order. And really having Jesus being the Lord of our life so that everything in our life is under his lordship, is in proper balance. First things are first, second things are second. You know, one of the fundamental passages for my wife and myself when we were getting married, so in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says the unbelievers are always worried what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what the future is going to bring. I say to you, 
seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness and these other things will be added as well because your heavenly father knows you need them. So God, the father knows that we're living life on this earth. He knows we need the things we do to, to, to live. But he says, if you put first things first, the second things are going to be given because your father knows you need them. So absolutely. That does mean that we need to control this rather than this controlling us. We need to be limited in our exposure to media doesn't mean we can't watch a football game or doesn't mean we can't check the news, but to be addicted to it or compulsively checking or whatever like that is a problem. You know, so we need to be really limited. We need to be discerning too. You know, some of us should cancel our Netflix subscriptions. You know, some of us should get dumb phones and not smartphones. You know, like Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If you're right hand cause you to sin cut it off if your right foot cause you to stumble cut it off better to enter the kingdom without an eye without a hand without a foot than to go down to hell with an intact body so jesus basically says do whatever it takes to turn away from serious sin do whatever it takes to put me first in your life amen i love that do whatever it takes and i think uh ralph that's one of the challenges that we face is finding the strength to do whatever it takes. Um, I think one of the gifts of the internet, and there are some gifts that the internet allows is for instance, the fact that we're able to do this interview using a technology that connects us and can also point uh, people to renewalministries.net. This is Ralph's ministry. And if you go on this page, you'll get connected to Ralph and you'll discover more about his books, the books that he's written. Crisis of Truth was probably your most famous uh, until you wrote The Fulfillment of All Desire. But I think folks also know you from the choices we face, your weekly uh, uh, television program that you co-host, as, as well as the other uh, wonderful works that you do through Renewal Ministries. Um, more importantly, you're married. You're married to Anne, six kiddos. You're a grandfather, 19 grandkids. What is that? That's amazing. It is. Okay. So <laughs> I've agree. got a question. I need some wisdom here. All right. So none of my kids are married yet. And so my wife and I were looking for wisdom and insight great, regarding man. the reality of um, discerning and helping our kids discern uh, who's a good spouse, right? And so I, I need some wisdom here. Well, what's the age range of your children? 10 to 23. My oldest is 23. Uh, oh. I've got a 23-year-old, 21-year-old, 19, uh, 20, 19, and on down. Yeah. Well, I think the most important thing you can do to help them choose a spouse is to have a solid marriage yourself, which I know you have. They need to see what a good Catholic husband is like, what a good Catholic wife is like. And they're going to want something like that. And they're going to be able to tell the difference when they date people or meet people who aren't like that. So I think the most important thing is actually the, the witness that you and your wife give, the life you're living. And we're all imperfect as husbands and wives. We're all imperfect as parents. But nevertheless, it's it's powerful when you're trying to do the right thing in your marriage and family life. The next thing would be maybe just talking to them about, you know, what what should you be looking for in a husband or a wife? You know, just having some conversations with them and not trying to control their choice, you know, not trying to put pressure on them, but just to have a, you know, a peaceful conversation without, you know, sort of like beating them over the head with it, you know, just sort of like, uh, hey, let, you know, what do you think? What are you thinking? What are you looking for in a husband? What are you looking for in a wife? And what do you think is important? You know, just getting them thinking about those things, you know, type of thing. And then maybe another thing would be putting them in by environments where they can actually have a chance to meet somebody who could be a good Catholic husband or wife, you know? So those are, those are just, I love few. that. Okay. In fact, let's, let's, let's dig further into that. So we moved in part to be around other good Catholic families. Right. Um, but we, we've chosen to say to our kids, look, we'll support you to the extent that we can financially and going to college. If you go to Franciscan university, now you yeah. can go where you want, but if yeah. you want to receive our financial support, yeah. we, you know, here is, here's an option for you. And so yeah. we're going to have four kiddos at Franciscan university this fall. So praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. That's great. No, we, we've done something similar with our children. All six of them have gone to Franciscan university and 
Uh, sometimes we've had to say, hey, try it for a year and see what you think. Uh, and, you know, those who did it under that rubric, so to speak, you know, liked it and stayed. One daughter just didn't even want to go at all. And so we just felt like we will let her try Michigan State, see what happens. Wow. <laughs> the first time we visited her at Michigan State, we walked into her dorm and big banner, great sex expectations. They were having a sex fair and they're handing out contraceptives. And uh, she had to leave her her room because her roommate had her boyfriend staying overnight. So it was like, she said, you're not staying here. You're going to Franciscan University. You got to try it. This is the pit. And she she agreed. She didn't agree happily at the beginning, but she she got a lot out of Franciscan University and has a really good job now working for IBM. Is in a good Catholic marriage. And uh, so, yeah. Well, let me ask that question. And this was where I was probably 10 years ago. We were constantly looking to folks who are a bit ahead of us in life, life circumstances mm -hmm. and saying, what were the best things that you did that you're glad you did for your kids at that yeah. age and stage? And, and if you could do something different, what would you do? Yeah. Um, and basically like saying, we don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to have blind spots. What would you want to avoid? And one of the pieces of insight we got was it's not enough just to raise your kids while they're in your home, K through 12. You actually have to be so discerning about those college years and where they go to college. And it just feels like if that was true 10 years ago, it's just screaming louder even yeah. now, the crucial decisions that are associated with which college they go to. Would you agree with yeah. that? Yes. <laughs> that was easy. No, I, I I would like to say a few things about it. Please. My, my wife and myself marvel at good Catholic parents sort of somehow be blind to what's going on in prestigious universities. And a lot of uh, parents are more into their children getting into prestigious universities and uh then and not really looking at or understanding what's going on there regarding the faith. I, I can't tell you how many Catholic families have sent their kids to the University of Michigan and other places. And, you know, they've gotten into women's studies programs and learn how to be witches and lesbians, you know, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Now, sometimes in secular universities, if they get connected with a Christian ministry there, things can work out pretty well. But uh, for a lot of kids, it doesn't. And so you can't guarantee that your kids are going to stay in the faith by studying at Franciscan University, but there's a lot better chance that they're going to be encouraged in that direction. They're going to be, there's going to be more peer pressure in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. So, yeah. Yeah. But also, I, uh, I, was, I, 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 there's a, a wise father here of nine kiddos, uh, and he was saying that, um, you know, there's nothing perfect, but you can get a, a better mousetrap, right? So there's a, there's yeah. a better mousetrap. And then he doesn't believe in arranged marriages, just highly assisted marriages. And yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would say when Catholic parents are trying very hard, they can try too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, you, like you said, you don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to do wrong things. You are going to make mistakes. You are going to do wrong. You are going to make wrong decisions. So just that's just part of it. So don't freak out when you do. Just, you know, ask forgiveness from whoever you need to ask forgiveness for and move on, you know, and recognize that it's not primarily up to us. It's primarily up to the Lord's mercy and grace, you know, you know, working with our wisdom. But, yeah, I, I, I can't write a book now about how to get all your kids and all your grandchildren following the Lord. They are. I can't write a book about it. The Lord had mercy on us. You know, we tried and made mistakes and, you know. Whatever, you know, I can't, I don't have a recipe book for anybody other than those so, basic principles that we're talking about. Well, I love the basic principles. I want to ask you about the concept of helping um, tween and teen boys and girls yeah. to be able to be sustained and strengthened in faith through something like camps. Yeah. And I say that because that was a sort of a it was it was an initiative or sort of a big deal for you guys um, uh, connecting to um, boys camps that you guys had uh, Pine Hills Boys Camp 
in, in Michigan. And there's a, a camp that is taking inspiration from you all that's happening over here in Gig Harbor, Washington, folks. It's called uh, Camp Solanus and it's coming up. And so would you talk about the, the that concept of camps? Because my kids have done camps quite a bit through the years through the Catholic Church and through other local parishes. But I want to hear your experience of that. Well, I don't know how long I've been doing it, 30, 40 years. I don't know. But uh, it's been really an important thing for our middle school students, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and then going into ninth. And uh, uh, yeah, we have a summer camp. It's only a week long, one for boys, one for girls. We have them separate because what we discovered is that when it's mixed, the girls are really worried about how they look and which boys are they're impressing and which they're not. So we we really like the single sex camps. We really feel like that allows both the boys and the girls to focus on the Lord and not on all the things that boys and girls do. So um, we've been having them for years, and I say almost everybody that attends them has some really significant experience with the Lord. Now, if they don't go back to an environment that's going to kind of nurture that and, you know, kind of interpret it and steer them in the right direction, some people fall away, but they'll never forget that they met the Lord. And we've seen people come back years later saying, what happened to me at Pines Camp was, Pines Camp was real. I want to get my life together again to come back to the Lord. So, yeah, we just had a boys camp. I think about 120 boys and about 70 or 80 staff. And one of the great blessings we have is a lot of the graduates of the camps come back to help. And the older boys, high school boys, college boys, uh, really are tremendous role models for the younger boys. And uh, they, they really sacrifice a week out of their jobs or their vacations or whatever to do this. And it's really good. Same with the girls. Now, as always in the Catholic Church, the girls are even working in greater numbers. 200 girls and 100 counselors or whatever, you know, and uh, and the girls' camps are fabulous, and they've developed this whole pipeline of before the camp, after the camp, and there's a, a ministry we have to high school girls called Beloved Revolution, and then we have a ministry to the, the middle school girls, you know, and, you know, and, and we have the little girls even come, you know, for certain things. So we have this whole kind of generational pipeline for for girls. We're trying to build the same thing for boys. We actually have somebody just in the midst of moving here from Canada who's going to give some more weight to our pipeline for boys type of thing. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's very valuable. I'm really happy to hear that you're, you're having a camp and uh, – uh, it really can make a big difference in young boys and girls' lives. So um, I would definitely encourage anybody who's considering this or just hearing about it for the first time to, yeah, find out about it and do whatever you can for your, is it, is it middle school type of thing too? Yeah, or? it's the same thing that you talked about, right? So it's going to get those tween years and then you're looking yeah. for the high schoolers the, yeah. towards the end of their high school years to yeah. to be some of the leaders at the camp. Right. Right. And so yeah. really following your model uh, in mm -hmm. Michigan, um, in fact, the leader of the camp was out there with his boys and then is flying back and just taking further inspiration and equipping. And so if you're watching yeah. the video, you're seeing the website, folks, if you are in Western Washington or even just in my hearing voice, please check out St. Nicholas in Gig Harbor at stnicholascc.org. And there's the camps link right there, Camp Solanus, and it's coming up. Um, on August the 5th to the 10th at Camp Hamilton. That's Camp Hamilton is one of the principal CYO camps in uh, camp locations in the Archdiocese of Seattle. It is a great, great location where kids are off the grid. You don't get the internet there and the kids get to be out in nature. And my daughter served for several summers uh, at CYO camps we know tangibly the difference it's made in our kids' lives, but I'm even more excited about Camp Solanus. Again, it's the 5th to the 10th, precisely because it is drawing on the insights and the experience that you all uh, back in Michigan have really synthesized and condensed into how to do this in a way that will give kids uh, a lasting encounter with Christ. 
So I'm super excited about what's happening uh, as a result of, well, the, the impact of Renewal Ministries out here uh, in Gig Harbor. So look yeah. at that. Thanks be to God for that gift. Amen. Thanks be to God. And honestly, the devil's like a roaring lion trying to devour our young people. And we got to do everything we can to uh, strengthen them so that they can fight the battle themselves and protect them as appropriate as they get older. Yeah, amen. So, Ralph, um, I want to take us in a little bit of a different direction. You mentioned some of the things that God is doing right now to revive and help people be restored to faith and, and go deeper into faith. Mm -hmm. I see two movements right now. And I wonder how you see these movements interacting um, in ways that will help uh, advance God's kingdom and the, re and, and the renewal of the church. And that is um, the uh, encounter movement, which is really a, a, a just a, a specific expression of signs and wonders and deeds of power and, and baptism of the Holy Spirit come alive in, in, a, in a very specific way. And the recovery of reverence associated with often the traditional Latin mass, but then mm -hmm. flowing backwards into reverent Novus Ordo masses. Mm -hmm. So would you talk about those as sources of renewal today? Yes. Well, um, I just finished doing a week-long clergy conference with Scott Hahn in uh, West Virginia. I did one with him in Austin and California, and he calls himself a tradismatic. So he really likes to celebrate a very reverent uh, Nova Sordo at Orientum Mass in, in Steubenville, but he also admits that one of the really important things in his life is being baptized in the Spirit, and he speaks in tongues and things like that. So, uh, and then he of course participates in the uh, charismatic worship at Franciscan University. So. Uh, Yes, we really need to rediscover reverence for the holiness of God. You know, we need to rediscover fear of the Lord. And one of the things that's really holding back uh, God's action in, in the world and church day is people are fearing men more than God. They're fearing people's opinion more than God. They don't realize they're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for whether they've been obedient to the purpose that God created them for. So really we need to rediscover, rediscover just a sense of who God is. He's holy. And we really need to hang on every word and worship him with reverence, you know. And so the the uh, traditional liturgy, uh, extraordinary form, is strong in that, particularly in the full-fledged Sunday liturgies, you know. And I know Pope Benedict was hoping that you know, a wider experience of the extraordinary form would rub off on the Novo Sordo and help us understand how there should be a greater reverence in the liturgy. And so I think that's happened in a lot of ways. Like in uh, Ann Arbor, the regular post Vatican II liturgy, Novo Sordo, is celebrated with real reverence and real faith. And uh, it's it's very good. We're, we've never been so blessed as we have in all the parishes having really solid pastors and, you know, things really going well. Now, uh, at the same time, orthodoxy is not enough. Reverent liturgy is not enough. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So in Luke chapter 24, just before Jesus ascended, he told the disciples, well, first of all, on the road to Emmaus, he, he explained the scriptures to them again about what they're all about, who they're pointing to. And then in the breaking of the bread, say, oh, my goodness, it's him. So scripture, Eucharist. But then he goes on to say, I'll stay in the city until you receive power from on high. And then you'll be my witnesses, you know, in Jerusalem to the rest of the world. And I want you to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins in my name. So in the road to Emmaus, people focus on the Eucharist, but they need to also focus on the scripture that comes before the Eucharist. And they need to pay real good attention. Say so Jesus saying it's not enough. You've got to be powered, be clothed with power from on high. You really, and John Paul II says you can't have a new evangelization unless you have a new Pentecost. So, yeah, somehow or other, we got to bring all these things together, and they're a little bit sec segmented right now. Mm -hmm. And is you know even even apart from the traditional liturgy, there's 
contemplatives and charismatics and we need all the different dimensions of the Holy Spirit. We need everything the Lord has to give us. We need to just be Catholic. You know, for many years, I was, uh, you know, a leader in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and I'm grateful for the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. But I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, I felt like, you know, I don't want to focus just on the charisms or just on baptism of the Spirit. I just want to be a Catholic. I, I just want to live everything that God's given for us as Catholics. And so, yeah, we need reverent liturgy. We need orthodoxy. We need scripture. We need or the Holy Spirit. Well, and, and you know, Ralph, uh, again, I'm talking with Dr. Ralph Martin, and please uh, learn more if you don't know, if you're one of the few that are not familiar with Dr. Ralph Martin, go to renewalministries.net, and you can get access to so much of what he is doing and continues to do around the world very fruitfully. Um, so, Ralph, when I think about what is a kind of common point between the two, it's a it's a phrase that comes from uh, probably a dear brother in the Lord to you, Father Francis Martin. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you remember one of his themes, and, and I, I didn't Father quite Francis appreciate Lord. it. Sorry? He, he and Father Tom are probably praising the Lord together in heaven. I right know. Now. I know. Yes. And so he was just up the street from us. Uh, I lived in Gaithersburg when I first got married, and we would attend the, uh, the Mother of God prayer meetings that they had. Um, and so... Uh, he used to talk quite a bit about we live in a moment of a closed system. I don't know if you remember that phrase. He used to talk quite a bit about the modern world is marked by a closed system. And that was a, that was a worldview and a consciousness that lacked transcendence. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that one of the common points that links a reverent liturgy and the movement of the power of the Holy Spirit and signs and wonders and deeds of power is a breaking into the closed system, a mm -hmm. breaking open. You, you don't live in a closed system any longer if mm -hmm. God's moving in supernatural ways and displaying his kingdom in the midst of the earth. And if you come into the liturgy and being casual is not an option because you've come into the presence of the divine into mm -hmm. the presence of the holy, majestic God, and yeah. you're called upon to correspond to that. Yeah. It seems to me that there, that's one of the one of the ways that these two movements share a common link. It's destroying a closed system approach to the world. Yeah, that's great, Tom. Yeah, I think that's a, a great way of talking about it. So, uh, so Ralph, when I think about um, this moment, you're familiar, of course, with the Benedict option, right? So this no. idea that um, folks today who are going to live their faith and not lose their faith are folks who make conscious, intentional, determined decisions and actions to come together to live their lives as a protection against the corrosive and toxic effects of the wider culture. Yeah. And I've found that that's what I've found in my own life. When four years ago, we uprooted our family and moved from the Seattle area over to the Spokane Coeur d'Alene corridor. It was precisely because we felt like the house was on fire, right? There was a fire at the house and it wasn't in the barbecue. You weren't just enjoying hamburgers and the barbecue. No, the house was on fire. And unless you took, serious action you were going to lose the faith of your kids and that's not an easy message it's not yeah. an easy message when most people are still barbecuing yeah and so how what would you say how do you sort of help people break out of let's call it apathy when it comes yeah. to the level of uh here's a to quote father tom this is not business as usual. This is right. not time for business as usual Christianity. Half measures won't get it done. These yeah. are Father Tom phrases, right? Yeah. Um, uh, that's what it seems to me when I talk about heroic efforts. Half measures is a way of losing your kid's faith. Yeah. Well, I think there's two reasons why people incline towards half measures. One is just the weakness of the flesh, laziness, whatever. Uh, fear, how can I handle this anyway? I'm just going to ignore it, pretend it's okay. But I think there's two things in particular. 
I think unless people really encounter the Lord and experience the Lord's love and his kindness and his power, it's very, very hard to get motivated about helping other people to know him. But there's also something else. There's a worse virus in the church than COVID. It's the virus of universalism. You know, I'd say if you describe how many Catholics look at the world today, describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and almost everybody's going that way. Narrow is the way that leads to hell. Hardly anybody's going that way. The trouble with looking at reality that way is it's just the opposite of what Jesus himself says. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus says, Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. Narrow is the door that leads to life, difficult to road, and few are finding it. Jesus doesn't want there to be few who's finding it. Jesus doesn't want there to be many people heading to destruction. But he's, he's saying this is the reality. Yeah. Unless you break with the culture, unless you break with the world, unless you crucify your flesh, you know, unless you resist the devil, you will end up in destruction. And so the reason why I think a lot of people aren't able to take action about the salvation of their families is they sort of have this back of their mind presumption that, well, you know, we don't really need to get too intense about this and they'll be okay. And, you know, they're not serial killers and, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, go to prestigious colleges because tomorrow we're all going to heaven. Not true. So I think people need to wake up to the biblical worldview that there really is a heaven, that there really is a hell, and it really matters what we believe and how we live. And this culture is compelling us to accept what God calls serious sin as normal, and it's not normal, and it's gravely wrong. And we're being particularly attacked in the area of marriage and sexuality. And unless we really get clear about what the truth is in these areas, we're going to be badly misled, and going to, our life is going to run into misery, and we're going to be endangering our eternal salvation. So we got to get our kids into environments where they can see marriage and sexuality lived out in a good wholesome way and where they could be with other families that are moving in that direction too where there could be an articulated defense of the faith an articulated analysis of the lies of the enemy and the lies of the culture so but i think one of the reasons why people are lazy is they don't really believe that their children's salvation is at stake and they really presume that everybody's going to go to heaven or almost everybody's going to go to heaven. So I think we need to recover the biblical worldview. Yeah, I it's a, what's at stake, right? What's at stake in our right. lives? It right. it uh I, I'm personally of the opinion that um we're already experiencing calamity. Like the, the, you know, the culture of America is uh, this wider society of America is still so full of abundance at a material level. Mm -hmm. that it's it's veiling the degree to which calamity and destruction have already hit us and no, it's true it's true there's so much misery and so much chaos and so much pain in culture you know under the beautiful facades that people throw up underneath it it's like a mess you know? yeah yeah so, uh, so Ralph, as um, we're getting close to the end of our time together, uh, I have a couple of other, uh, just for me, important questions. So one of them is, we talk about the way in which the world will attempt to deceive believers. And we get mm -hmm. that, right? So there'll be anti-Catholic, anti-Christian, anti-godly forces in our culture. And anybody who doubts that is just doesn't have their eyes open. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the the greater challenge is the anti-Christ spirit in the church, which would attempt, da -da -da -dum. excuse me. Da -da -da -dum. Well, you think about it, right? And it's what? It's clever presentations of, of anti-gospel ideas that attempt to rationalize and reconcile them with authentic church teaching. Yeah. And so we have this, tragic anti-christ spirit that is coming from some church leaders that are just leading people to feel comfortable in their embrace of outright evil yes this is very very serious and very very difficult you know the bishops 
have been trying to keep a facade of unity, but there's always been some measure of serious disunity, but now it's out in the open. Not only is it out in the open, but we have really prominent leaders in the church now openly advocating for things which are a departure from the faith. So what are Catholics going to do when Cardinal McElroy says uh, anybody should come to the Eucharist, even if you're not committed to living a chaste life, and particularly the LGBTQ community? And Bishop Daly says, no, that's not true. Or when Bishop Paprocki says, hey, that's heresy. Or Archbishop Shaquilla writes a very reasoned a critique of what's going on in Germany, you know, and and yet at the same time, we have Cardinal Hollerich from Luxembourg leading the Synod, and we have Cardinal Grech, you know. A anyway, yeah, we got a big problem, and we got confusion in Rome. We don't have a clear voice. And so Catholics, I need to now take responsibility for really knowing the faith. You need to know what scripture says. You need to know what the catechism of the Catholic Church says. You need to begin to take personal responsibility for knowing the faith so you can discern truth from false because you're going to have to do that and you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to say, well, so-and-so says this and so-and-so says this. you got to be able to say, well, what so-and-so is saying isn't what the truth is, isn't what Jesus says, isn't what the church teaches, even though he's a high churchman. That's going to be a new experience for Catholics. It's going to be very, very hard to get to that point, but we have to. Well, it feels like we're back at the age, like I, one way I characterize it is that's back at the age of Athanasius, right? Mm -hmm. So Athanasius against the world and, yeah. you know, and, and it was over doctrine. You go forward 500 years and you have Pope Gregory and, and St. Peter Damien, and they're going against sexual immorality, especially same-sex immorality. And uh, and then you go forward 500 years, and it's a church that is battling against political power and riches. And it feels like all three of those errors have collided into this moment 500 years later, where we have the doctrinal, the moral, and the political material yeah. all yes. colliding into yeah. a church yeah. where we're called to become saints. And saints, I think, increasingly by being willing to witness with even our lives. You know, an age yeah. of new martyrs is probably approaching. Yeah, and Jesus says, you know, there's going to be opposition, there's going to be persecution, but if you're ashamed of me before people, I'm going to be ashamed of you before the Father in heaven. And so we got to develop that relationship with Jesus. We just got to know him because I think the only way Catholics can survive in the future is because of personal loyalty to Jesus, personal love for Jesus and knowledge of what he really wants and what his will is and what his teaching is. Yeah, but at the same time, it's easy for people to get scared or discouraged. And people, I, I wrote a new book, Tom, called The Church in Crisis, Pathways Forward. And it, it really goes into detail about the deception, deceptions within the church right now, and how difficult it is. But a lot of times people say, Ralph, you know, a lot of stuff going on, aren't you discouraged? Not at all. I'm not discouraged because there's nothing happening in the world or in the church that's not happening under the providence of God. God's got a plan. As difficult as it is to bring good out of this, we just got to kind of keep our eyes on Jesus, keep our eyes on the true teachings of the church, which, which are not hard to find, and, and just really ask God for the fortitude, the courage to persevere in the, in the face of growing persecution. Last word, Ralph. Uh... You talked about uh, pointing uh, pointing to Jesus ourselves, experiencing that personal relationship, surrendering to him, and that'll help us overcome deception and be protected. If it, it seems in our lives, Carrie and me, when we talk about raising our kids, the tender years when they're in sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, where they still have an openness, yeah. that becomes a prime opportunity to have young men and young women be invited to welcome Christ in. And I think, again, just a, as a final word, yeah. the gift of your Pine Hills Boys Camp and Girls Camp and Camp Solanus happening out here, yeah. don't miss that opportunity. Amen. I agree. 100%. Go to the camp. Go to the camp, folks. Well, Ralph, thank you so much for taking time with me today. What a great gift. Thanks for being with me. I really appreciate our chance to be able to visit. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate your perseverance all these years. Keep on. Amen. God bless. Yeah.